Mary Adler is a seven-year-old girl who lives with her Uncle Frank. Today is her first day at school and she's not happy about it. Where's the special? She says she would gladly walk the plank if that only meant her own sacrifice. But who's going to take care of Fred the cat? Obviously not falling for any of that, Frank walks her to the school bus and says she should try to have some fun. I don't know, try being a kid. Then he goes back inside, walking a bit faster than normal. His neighbor, Roberta, is coming. She has her own opinions about Mary's education, and more importantly, she has her own set of keys. You're technically allowed to use those keys whenever you want. So slamming the door shut won't save him. Frank gives her the usual speech about going out in the world and making friends, but she's not even listening. For some reason, Roberta is afraid that Mary might be taken away from Frank. At Howard School, Bonnie Stevenson is teaching her first graders stuff like one plus one. One plus one is two. Mary cannot hide her exasperated boredom. Reminding everyone that no student is allowed to speak without permission, Bonnie decides to make an example out of this mouthy kid. She makes her stand and asks what is 8 plus 8, then 17 plus 15, and Mary can answer every question without batting an eyelid. Yeah, yes, it is. That's good. Bonnie keeps going until the point where she herself needs a calculator to confirm that the answer is correct. And it seems this is definitely not Bonnie's lucky day. Mrs. Davis, the school principal, decides to stop by her classroom for a welcome chat with the kids. Mary raises her hand, inquiring if Davis is the boss. She's the boss. She then tells her to get on the phone with Frank immediately and have him pick her up as soon as he can. Even the kids are shocked at this. At the end of the school day, another teacher tells Bonnie that Frank is the hot, silent guy at Ferg's. What are you doing at Ferg's every Friday night? Bonnie chases him to the car to say that Mary might be a gifted child. He says she's mistaken. It's just a math method he used when homeschooling her. Nothing more than just a party trick, really. After they leave, Bonnie makes sure to look up the method online. She's clearly not buying that story. That doesn't mean that Bonnie's curiosity has been fulfilled. She Googles the family and finds out that Mary's mother was the brilliant mathematician Diane Adler, who tragically took her own life at the age of 27. Making use of her colleagues' earlier tips, she goes to that bar where Frank is a local and doesn't even try to hide that she's there to ambush him. The truth about Mary, my student. As Frank works repairing boats, he gets to take Mary with him sometimes and now they're both at the docks talking about school. Mary is telling Frank that it's not fair that she gets in trouble for answering questions correctly. He points out that maybe the actual problem was yelling at the principal, but that's not entirely true because he also brings up their earlier agreement. She had promised not to show off at school like that. A few days later in the classroom, we see that Bonnie's keeping an eye on her brightest pupil all the time. Today is Mary's show and tell and she's brought Fred. He has just one eye. The kids are curious about the one-eyed cat and a little boy named Justin asks what happened, but Mary doesn't know. He was already a monocular cat when she found him in a trash can. Bonnie is relieved to see the presentation is a success. That's when their dynamics start to shift. Instead of always dreading Mary's next outburst, Bonnie makes sure to keep her busy with very challenging extra activities to do. Mary's behavior is significantly improved. Frank has no choice but to tell the truth this time. Six years ago, Diane showed up at his place with her baby baby and said she needed to talk. As he was late for a date, he told her they could talk when he got back home. It was too late by then. Diane was gone. Mary was on the couch and found Diane on the bathroom floor. Mary's father was never in the picture, and as for grandparents, Frank's dad had passed away and his mom had cut ties with Diane ever since the pregnancy. That brings us to Uncle Frank, who's now raising a genius. But Mary is not just a genius. She's also very short-fused, and it's not long before an incident happens. On the school bus, Justin is carefully carrying his art project when an older boy trips him and then it's all destroyed. Mary yells at the bully and he starts to laugh, but she can see that this boy just needs a high five in the face with a heavy book. Not surprisingly, Frank gets called to the principal's office at Howard School. Mrs. Davis says Mary could be expelled for such behavior. You know, she could be expelled. Frank makes it clear that while he disapproves of the use of violence, he's actually very proud of his niece. Defending another seven-year-old against an older boy takes a lot of courage, and yet she didn't hesitate. Mildly shocked to hear this, Davis begins to steer the topic to a different direction, more precisely in the direction of the Oaks Academy for Gifted Education. Davis is a personal friend of the headmasters, and she can get Mary a full scholarship. Frank says no thanks. The family has a terrible history with that kind of school. Now completely shocked, Davis tells him he's making a huge mistake. Almost forgetting what her job is. She says Howard School is no place for a genius like Mary. Then Frank says they are free to dumb her down if that makes her a decent human being. Just dumb her down into a decent human being.
The moment he leaves, Davis tells her secretary to gather all the paperwork they have on this student. Bonnie goes after him to ask if he is sure about this, and he says no. Later in the classroom, Bonnie makes Mary stand up and say that hitting people is wrong. She won't do it again and no one needs to be afraid of her. Then she asks permission to say something she actually wants to. She tells the kids that before it got ruined, Justin's art project was awesome. So it looks like we can tick that decent human being box. Not thanks to Evelyn Adler, the grandmother Mary has trouble recognizing as the fancy lady standing by their front door. Holy sh! Grandma gives her a brand new MacBook, ignoring Frank's sigh when she mentions that it's full of advanced math books. Frank cuts the visit short using the school night card, and then he walks his mother to the car. Confirming his suspicions, Evelyn admits she's been contacted by Principal Davis about Mary's wasted potential. She wants to talk about it, but she refuses to visit them again because of her allergy to cats. That may be true, but it's also evident that she is horrified at the sight of her own family members living like they're middle class. On the next day, Frank meets his mother for lunch, saying that the child's best interest is what matters. She declares that she's not leaving without her granddaughter. Well, welcome to Florida. As she's in a better position to enrich her life, Frank brings up his sister's wishes. Diane wanted Mary to have a normal life. Evelyn says Mary's not a normal child. Giving her a normal life is negligence. When Frank says she'll bury the girl in tutors and then loan her out to the highest bidding think tank, she's not even offended or trying to deny such intentions. Greatness comes at a high price. The next time they meet, it's in a courtroom. Mr. Cullen is representing Frank and he says it was Diane's wish that her brother would raise Mary. Evelyn's lawyer says that he didn't have to take her across state lines to do so. He also describes their living conditions as unclean, but Cullen refutes that. Currently lives in unclean and unwholesome condition. The judge sends someone to check Frank's house and the way he's been raising Mary. In the meantime, he grants Evelyn reasonable access to the child, which means Frank is forced to let her see Mary. After Frank getting an earful from Roberta about letting all of this happen, Frank goes to that same bar, Ferg's. It's no surprise then that Bonnie shows up to have a word. She apologizes to him and says she was devastated to hear Davis bragging about the custody battle she initiated. Frank is not a guy that holds grudges, so they just keep talking and drinking. They get more and more comfortable together and Bonnie suddenly realizes this might be a bad idea. She says he is the guardian of her student and hooking up now would be unethical and that's why it cannot happen. Obviously, that is precisely what happens. She spends the night at Frank's with his guarantee that Mary never comes back from Roberta's before noon. Of course, every rule has its exceptions, and it had to be today that Mary wants to watch a specific DVD. Realizing that she forgot to bring it, she runs home with Roberta's keys and catches her teacher, not in the act thankfully, but still wrapped in the sheets. For the first time, Mary chants that good morning Miss Stevenson, just like the other kids do. Good morning Miss Stevenson. Frank walks Bonnie to the car with the most awkward conversation. Then he tries to talk to Mary about what happened, but makes it all worse. Stepping on a Lego block doesn't help his mood. He ends up yelling at her for having used Roberta's key and says he wants his own life back. Mary starts to cry and slams her bedroom door. After she calms down, he tries again. He says nothing that happened in the morning was her fault. He was actually mad at himself and Lego manufacturers maybe. Mary asks if he has no life because of her and he swears he didn't mean that. To support his claim, he mentions a conversation they had last month where he refused to buy her a piano and she wished death upon him. Mary has to admit she didn't mean that either, but she takes the opportunity to ask again if she could have the piano. No luck there, but she had to try, right? Later on, Frank is getting the mail and there's the dreaded letter from his mother's lawyer. It looks like Mary's about to go on a two-day trip to Boston. The night she gets there, Evelyn shows her a photo album with pictures of Diane. And then there's another one with older pictures of young Evelyn back in her Cambridge days. She talks about her study group and all the advanced math research they were doing. Mary is very impressed and asks if she came to the US to teach at some university University. Cool. With a sad look, Evelyn says she came here to get married and have kids. No more math since then. While Bonnie's on a boat with Frank, talking about her nightmares of getting fired, Evelyn takes Mary to MIT. Looking at the wall with the seven millennium problems, they can see only one has been solved. The mathematician who pulled it off has his picture up on the wall. Then Evelyn shows her the Navier-Stokes problem, which Diane spent most of her life trying to solve. There's no photo to go with it, and Mary gets upset to realize that her mother failed. But 
but then she says maybe one day her own picture will be there. That's all Evelyn wants to hear. She tells Mary her name can live forever if she works hard enough. They go into a lecture hall where Professor Shankland had been waiting for them. Mary looks at a problem on the blackboard for a long time and Evelyn starts to get upset with Shankland's comments. He's not very impressed with this little girl. Evelyn says she has traveled the day before and slept in a new bed, but he's not having any of these excuses. On their way out, Mary can see her grandmother is upset. She says she's not mad at her, she's mad at the professor. He must have selected a particularly hard problem. Then Mary says the problem on the blackboard was not difficult. She couldn't solve it because it was wrong. You forgot the negative sign on the exponent. It had been copied with a mistake. Immediately realizing that the mistake was included as a trick to further test the child, Evelyn takes her back there. Mary makes the necessary corrections and then fills the whole blackboard in numbers and signs until the problem is solved. Professor Shanklin asks why she didn't say anything before, and she explains that Frank taught her not to correct older people. Nobody likes a know-it-all. When the trip is over and Evelyn drops her off, Frank invites her in, but she uses the allergy to cats as an excuse to decline. In the courtroom, she has a surprise for Frank. A man named Bradley Pollard is taking the stand. He is Mary's biological father, and he signed an affidavit appointing Evelyn as her guardian. They seem to be expecting to see some despair over the other side, but Mr. Cullen could not look less worried as he stands up to cross-examine Pollard. With a few questions, he can establish that Pollard has never seen his own daughter and doesn't even know her middle name. He claims that he tried to find her, but a simple Google search turns up an article that could have easily led to her years ago. So there goes his affidavit into the the trash. At night, Cullen comes to the docks to tell Frank that they are offering him a deal. They want to put Mary in a mutually approved foster family no more than 30 minutes from him. She would have to attend Oaks Academy, but she would still be able to get back to court in five years to decide for herself. You like this deal? Frank is shocked that Cullen seems to like the deal and his lawyer explains that, knowing that judge, he'll probably side with the money. So Frank agrees to check out the foster family. It's a fabulous home with a beautiful piano and the very nice couple says they are fine with cats. Clearly, Frank has been battling his own doubts about himself as a guardian and now he has no more excuses. He takes the deal. Just as expected, Mary is devastated by that decision. She throws a huge tantrum when it's time to say goodbye and he's forced to walk away from a sobbing child. Bonnie comes to see him on a boat, but he's completely miserable now and pushes her away. On visitation day, he brings Mary a present, but doesn't have the chance to give it to her. The foster dad says she's having a meltdown and refuses to see Frank. She don't want to see you. Back at Howard School, Bonnie also has an unpleasant surprise looking at the bulletin board. Fred seems to be up for adoption and she knows Mary would never be okay with that. As Frank is still not picking up her calls, she takes a picture of the sign and sends it to him. He gets beside himself to see that. He drives to the animal shelter and gets there just in time to save Fred from euthanasia. Interrogating the staff, he finds out that the guy who brought the cat said something about allergies. That's when Frank sees that this whole foster family deal was nothing but a clever trick. He confirms that by barging into their guest house where he finds his mother and a bunch of tutors around Mary. Thinking that he hadn't even visited her, Mary bursts into tears and runs outside. Before going after her, Frank throws a manuscript at Evelyn. She's about to call the cops when she sees what it is. It's the solution to Navier Stokes, the millennium problem. Catching up with Mary, Frank apologizes for his mistake. He has always wondered if he was giving her enough. Because I thought I was bad for you but he must be doing something right if she has turned out to be the girl she is now. Evelyn refuses to believe that this is the real deal. If Diane really had solved it, why not publish? Frank says he was given clear instructions. He was supposed to publish it only after Evelyn's death. That's how much Diane hated her. So now, after repeatedly ruining their kids' lives, she has that surprised Pikachu look on her face. Frank then helps her to sum it up. There are two things Diane didn't want her to have, Mary and the Navier Stokes. She can pick one. A few weeks later, we see Mary in a Girl Scout vest taking a crazy hard math lesson. Frank picks her up and drops her off at a playground. It looks like Mary has finally made a few friends, and she's even ready to have some fun with them. Bonnie is there too, watching the kids. Apparently, Frank has a friend of his own. And this is the end. This was a recap of the 2017 movie Gifted by TSG Entertainment, starring Chris Evans and McKenna Grace. So tell me, what would you do if you were Frank? Do you think Evelyn had a point at all, or was she just an evil grandma? Let us know in the comments below with hashtag CinemaRecap, and until next time.